Joining us in Singapore, James Dorsey, a Director Senior Fellow on the Middle East at Singapore's Raja Ratnam School of International Studies. In Beirut, we are joined by Makram Rabah, who is an Assistant Professor at Department of History with American University of Beirut. Last but not least in Beijing, Wang Jin, Associate Professor from Northwest University of China. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Latest escalation of tensions between the two sides and also the conflict certainly has uh, once again alerted everyone about the situation. Now, Mr. Rachman, uh, tell me more about your thoughts on what is the nature of the conflict. I think that the failure of diplomacy will continue for more and more escalation, especially the trying to contain the so-called Iranian axis or trying to force a kind of ceasefire with Hamas has proven futile, certainly because also Netanyahu has been very, very clear in the past uh, weeks or even months that by killing uh, Hania, he doesn't really uh, intend to sit down on the table. At the same time, what had happened between Hezbollah and Israel over the weekend has proven that the, uh, the, the democratic administration and the White House has drawn somewhat of a red line. Yet, all this might lead to more violence because nothing is guaranteed. Mm. Mr. Wang, of course, uh, there is a very complicated uh, historical, religious, political, economic uh, backdrop, as we all know, for decades. Now, uh, eight, throughout history of even a few thousand years has always been an uh, area of controversy. Do you see these latest attacks toward one another as a backdrop of uh, give and take for a negotiation that is going on right now? My, my personally, I think uh, I understand that the latest conflict as a continuation uh, between Israel and the Hezbollah uh, that has been lasted for months, especially er erupted last October when the latest uh, 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 war erupted between Hamas and Israel. So, uh, we, of course, it is a much bigger scale. It is a much intensified war, but uh, but it's actually the continuation of Israeli conflict with Hezbollah in in this northern frontier. Uh, so. Of course, some states have tried to mediate, some diplomatic efforts have been introduced, mm. but the, the biggest problem is that neither sides, they have the, the trust uh, uh, towards each other, towards the other side. And also, there were no reliable and sustainable diplomatic and mediation mechanism to help bridge the two different conflicting sides to the mm. negotiation table. So, I, so that is why I think it is maybe a continuation, and also in the future, the war will continue between the two sides, Israel and Hezbollah. Mm. Can we? Mr. Dorsey, of course, we are seeing uh, what's going on in the region, but also in the bigger picture, we also see there is an election going on in the United States. As you know, the U.S. has always been one of the most important backdrops of all the conflicts in the Middle East. Now, uh, the current administration in Washington is trying to apparently show the rest of the world is making its efforts. However, uh, there are many who do not necessarily believe they're going to play a constructive role. Having said that, though, Mr. Dorsey, uh, how do you see uh, what is going on right now with that specific story on conflict and with the bigger backdrop that we're touching on right now? I think the, the issue is what you're seeing is increasingly strained relations between the Biden administration and the, uh, and the Israelis, particularly Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, that, again, particularly in an election uh, uh, period, is unlikely or may not translate into concrete pressure on Israel and on Netanyahu to, uh, to, to make concessions. Mm -hmm. I think the other problem that we also have here is that there are things that Israel and the United States agree on fundamentally. They see Hamas, as well as Hezbollah, as a terrorist organization. So the notion that you want to destroy those organizations or deter those organizations is, is basically a shared policy goal, even if the way you go about that uh, may, be, may be different. There's one last point that I do want to make is that we've seen in the statements, particularly by Jake Sullivan, a slight, and again, it's reading tea leaves, but for the first time, you've seen a senior U.S. official, by implication, say that Hamas was being constructive. 
in these um, negotiations. Mm. And that's a signal that will not have gone unnoticed in Jerusalem. Mm. Though we know in the region there are so many factors, uh, in fact, that are playing their roles and they are having issues with one another as well besides Israel. So um, how do you see the possibility of these different factors coming to certain kind of consensus in order to have bigger, bigger say in the negotiations and in the designing of the future maps? We have been hearing about uh, Saudi Arabia's request for a proper peace deal between the Arabs and Israel. And I think this is where Netanyahu will be tested, and this is where the, uh, the U.S. administration, be it a Democratic one or a Republican one, will be tested. Trump's approach to the whole uh, Arab-Israeli conflict was more of a business transaction, and this mm -hmm. is where it has failed abysmally. People want peace, but peace has to be done on a fair and a long-term uh, uh, long -term solution for the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I think at least what is happening now, be it the war in Ukraine or what's happening in Palestine and Lebanon, I think that the majority of the people are just tired of killing and getting killed. And this is where I think people will move forward, given, given the chance. There are increasing number of nations uh, at the United Nations, for example, trying to suggest that they support uh, the two separate states, Israel and also uh, Palestine. Uh, and they are recognizing the state of Palestine. So um, on an even bigger backdrop than just the U.S. and the Middle East, we are seeing different factors that are moving uh, some suggest in some similar directions. But how much hope do you have uh, in believing the power and also the path that these uh, different nations uh, could have on the future? Uh, Mr. Wang. Uh, you are right, Tianwei. A lot of voices has been uh, encouraged or has been spoken out uh, for the two state solution for the Israel and Palestinian peace. And, and that should continually to be the directive and the principle uh, for the future solutions to end the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, to reach the long lasting and just the peace between the two sides. Uh, but the problem is that it's just a kind of the principle and how to implement it. Because if we, if we are talking about uh, the, the process of implementing, there will be a large, um, a large number of the small but very sensitive and important topics but the direction should be maintained. The spirit should be uh, sustained and also the, the principle should be upheld. That is no doubt. But uh, how to implement it, I think we need more time, more patience. China has been, Mr. Wang, playing a more active role we see over the past few years, of including bringing some of the key members of uh, different factors together for negotiations and discussions. And yet we see uh, situations once again become complicated, even though some kinds of friendly consensus were temporarily reached uh, with China's support. Now, uh, what do you think has been China's takeaway as a scholar uh, from this country? And what do you see the role that China and others, uh, you know, from the uh, region and from Asia could have in the uh, future path of the issue? Mr. Wang. I think China and uh, as well as other uh, Asian countries uh, has been highly expected by uh, the Middle Eastern countries because every time when I uh, held a conference with Arab uh, scholars and researchers, they always held a very high expectation about Chinese roles in the peace process in the Middle East, especially for the helping facilitate peace between different factors, different actors, different uh, different states uh, to end their crisis and their rivalries. So that, that is why I think China is highly expected. And also, on the other hand, China is willing to and will continue to be willing to uh, provide our own assistance uh, through the very active and constructive role to help pacifying the tension in this region. For example, as you mentioned, last year, China successfully facilitated the peace process between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. And also in, uh, this year, I mean, just a month ago, China successfully uh, mediated the, the internal declaration uh, from 14 Palestinian factions. That is very important, a historical step that has been made by the uh, by, by the mediators, I mean, to, to help uh, fasten the peace process inside Palestinian 
different factions. So I think that is why in, in the future, China will continue to offer our own assistance and offer our own wisdom all together with regional countries and other uh, international community states to help uh, facilitate the peace process in this region. Mr. Dorsey? I think the harsh reality is threefold. There is only one party that can influence Israel. And that hasn't been tested really. So we don't know to the degree to which le US leverage would work. The second thing we know is that the international community does not have a mechanism to implement its uh, wishes and decisions. And so sure, the international community can say what it wants. It's the power, it's the power, the, the countries that have influence and power in this case with Israel, only the United States. The third issue is Israel doesn't care. It sees support for the Palestinians, criticism of Israel as part of an anti-Jewish, anti-Israeli conspiracy. And therefore, as fundamentally says, I don't care what you say. Now, the fourth point and final point I'd like to make is that we are fixated on this Israeli government. Prime Minister Netanyahu, the National Security Minister, Itamar ben Gvir, and so on and so forth. The reality is that Israelis may differ on how to go about things, but they at this point agree on fundamentals. And one of those fundamentals is no Palestinian state and no recognition of Palestinian rights. So the issue is much broader and much more fundamental than whether or not uh, Netanyahu plays games in ceasefire negotiations. Mr. Raba. Well, I, I do agree here that uh, the U.S. is the only power player in the sense that it can impose a kind of uh, a peace or actually put more pressure. But at the same time, I think going back and looking how Beijing played a very important role in basically mediating between, uh, between Iran and the Gulf states, I think I don't want us to think what the scenario would be if, let's say, Iran uh, uh, is looking at Saudi Arabia as a potential enemy. So rather than just having chaos in the Levant, I think this would spread to the Arab Gulf. And I think that China, by using somewhat of soft power, has played an important role in neutralizing some elements. Yet at the same time, I think that essentially, while the international community might have faltered on a number of issues, I think that we have to go back to the idea that both the Palestinians and the Israelis ha have failed in putting forth more creative ideas.